So welcome to the welcome to the last uh, session for track three, and uh, I like to introduce uh, Javier Gonzalez, and uh, as a managing partner and CEO, CISO, and uh, Javier. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being so brave and uh, sticking out this late, you know, today. Um, again, Javier Gonzalez, uh, Verily IT. Um, Managing partner, founder, uh, CISO, VCISO uh, with it. And this afternoon, we'll be talking a little bit about a trend that is going on right now in the market. Uh, and I'll uh, be talking about everything from kind of like the genesis, some of the foundational elements of the trend, uh, as well where we go in with these different things and uh, talking into the VCISO specifically about the advantages, um, the different benefits that companies get with the uh, approach of the VC, so and the why they're going with the VC, so which is important. Um, I also give you a little bit of the um, uh, kind of like um, walkthrough about you know what to expect right in the future and whatnot, uh, and then um, you know we'll wrap up if there are any questions and whatnot. Uh, uh, that I'll be able to answer any anything you want to ask, you know, at all. So for me, I've been in the IT business since 1992, approximately. It was a little before that, but, you know, that's what I call it because that's when I officially got my first job properly where I make uh, uh, wages on it. So um, I've been three-time CISO, one-time CTO. I've been with different companies from small, uh, very small, my company included, uh, to very large companies as HP, you know, 300,000, you know, employees. Um, on the personal side, you know, I'm somebody that probably a little different than the norm. I really like to spend the time around the house doing stuff, right, fixing stuff and kind of like being since uh, I was a little kid, you know, that curiosity about how things work and that probably is a big part of why I selected this track in, in my career. Uh, when I have time, which is very uh, infrequently, I like to scuba dive. I'm a rescue diver. Um, love the scuba diving world because it's such a immersive and personal, right? You know, you're underwater, only the sounds of the ocean or the body of water you're in. Uh, really, you can't talk, so it's really an opportunity for you to observe, and I think that uh, is good therapy, you know, into that. I also love to cook, um, do all sorts of different things, you know, everything from having a huge uh, smoker and whatnot and, you know, things inside that, and try to invent and come up with new creative things, you know, for, for cooking. And uh, I will say last but probably most importantly uh, is that I like to talk. You know, anyone that knows me, you know, will we'll figure that very, very quickly that I, I like to talk. So, <clears throat> very, really, really quick, you know, I'll go through these slides. Obviously, I give you a, a preview. We're going to be talking about the landscape, uh, kind of like the rise of the VC so well. What are the advantages? Um, you know, everything from the cost side, the expertise that you bring in, how adaptable and manageable you are. Uh, give you a little bit of the bigger picture, right? Uh, um, and then I'll spend some time giving you a little bit about my journey, and then we'll look ahead. Where is this going? Along the way, um, I'll be trying to insert, you know, some of the elements that AI, you know, brings into this whole mix. Um, for, for those of you that have been in the different sessions, you heard um, kind of like the good, the bad, and the ugly, plus the uncertainty. So I'll give you my spin too as well, and you know when it comes to AI, specifically into the CISO world, because it's very important. It's such a nascent technology, uh, and we're really struggling to what is exactly that we need to do. Business, we know they have to move into AI, but we're not really sure how to proceed yet, right? You know, there's a lot of cautions, there's a, a lot of uncertainty out there. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that. So with that said, just for full dis, you know, disclosure, all the images that you'll see here, they're all AI generated, nothing from my side, no, nowhere picked up, you know, so I went to the alley, hey, create this for me, boom, done. 
So, um, so let's jump into the landscape, right? Um, and this is in general terms, right? You know, one of the biggest things that any CISO confront today is digital transformation. If you ever heard of this little thing called cloud, I'll, I think that in any way, shape, or form, CISOs are in that journey right now, right? You know, some are more accelerated than others. Uh, some companies are still behind. They're looking to figure out what to do. Uh, but for the most part, they're already there. You know, they either are consuming some sort of a SaaS model, whether it's O365, uh, you know, uh, Salesforce, um, whatever other iterations that you have out there in, in, in the world that they're already there. And they're, they're thinking, right? They're debating, do we jump into this? Do we go into a different model? Um, I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit more in, in terms of the financial banking uh, industry because that's where you know the last few years my, my experience has been concentrated and how they actually approach that. Um, also, you know, talk about in, in that digital transformation some of the injections that AI have done and companies are not even realizing that these things are already there, right? You know, they're figuring out and thinking this is something that I just give to my employees in a very explicit way. But the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the uh, companies out there, they're already in that journey and they have uh, implemented in, in, in even smaller ways, you know, AI models into their mo uh, business models. So um, we'll see a little bit about that and, you know, talk, um, you know, a little more in depth into that. Second part is as, as cloud and everything else is out there, that brings complexity. Complexity is not a a friend of the CISO. The more complex, the more uh, friction causes to the, to the environment, right? You know, so we CISOs are always looked as the doctor knows of the world, right? Because we're always looking at ways to protect the companies and not always um, uh, the solutions that we come up with um, really helps to speed up the business. Um, and so sometimes that, um, put us in a position, right, you know, that uh, we're in, in direct, um, I'll say, line of confrontation with the rest of the, of the organization. Because they're looking to implement things, they're looking to actually accelerate business growth, and they see that we come in and start asking for implementation of controls or ways to validate uh, that the, the, the information is going to be secure, uh, we're slowing them down. So complexity definitely is one of the factors that we have to deal uh, on a daily basis and then figure out how do we actually give the business what they need, but at the same time doing it as, as frictionless as possible. Then obviously we have the bad actors, right? Um, threats, they're coming all sorts of shapes uh, and ways today. Uh, AI, as you heard in, in some of the other um, uh, presentations, is making it even dif more difficult for us, right? You know, it's, it's, it's more, uh, I will say, um, challenging, you know, for, the, for our jobs because while we are transforming, while we're getting more complexity and yet, you know, getting more threats, we don't have the luxury to actually pivot as quickly as possible. We got tooling that we have made substantial investments on that we can just you know, throw out and then bring something else, right? You know, so, so that right there then put us in, into a, a, a different path because now we understand that we need to change, but at the same time, we may not have the resources. We cannot just rip and replace what we have just to adapt to what we have in, in the forms of the threats. So what, what's the re end result of that, right? So the end result is that we're gonna to continue to have an increase in, in incidents. And we see this every day you know, in the news. You know, companies getting uh, hacked, you know, ransomware continues to be rampant. Um, uh, 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 information leaks, right? Breaches of all sorts. Uh, so, so definitely it's not gonna decrease, but only increase you know, over time. So, so that makes it even more challenging for us. 
Then obviously we have the other side, which is that we have to comply with, uh, with the regulations and the laws that we have established. In the financial uh, world, we got all sorts of different ones. Uh, for those of you that follow these closely, I'm sure that uh, for public companies, you heard about the SEC rule, right? And now we have a 72-hour rule that says that after a material breach, we have to report, you know, an incident. Well, there we go again. Do we, know? we have another challenge element because now we have to not only protect, now we have to start working and try to figure out what a material breach really means. And this is not as black and white as most people think that they are because these, these are things that you really need to make sure that it really is going to have that impact. So as a result, what we get from it is that we may either under-report, which means that we don't report something because we didn't think that we, it will ever reach that level, or we will then report and we didn't have to report, and now we open ourselves, you know, to all sorts of different scrutiny because now it's public. As soon as these things actually go to the SEC and you have filed a report, they basically become public records. So, so those are things that, you know, it's a great balance, you know, that uh, you have to establish and it's not getting any, any, any easier for us. So in the end, the implications that this bring is that um, we, we have to look for solutions that continue to help the business to expand and grow while we maintain security. So that balance, I mean, you know, finding that equilibrium is, is definitely something that we all, you know, aim to achieve, but it's not getting any easier. Uh, in fact, it's getting uh, a lot harder, you know, over time. So let me switch now and move into um, the role of the traditional CISO. Uh, for those of you that have been uh, a CISO or follow very closely to this, you know, CISOs are being boxed, you know, somebody that is going to come and do my strategy. They are the ones who are going to take over my policies, my procedures. They're going to put the governance structure over my program. Um, obviously, they're going to ensure that risk is managed at the proper level uh, as it terms, you know, as it, as it relates to cybersecurity. Um, and most, you know, CISOs are also look as being the incident, you know, leaders, right? You know, and rightly so. So we have to be prepared to uh, lead the organizations when a breach uh, of sorts, you know, happen in the organization. Security awareness, you know, they're also, you know, part of what, you know, the CISOs, you know, have to look. And obviously developing the next generation of leaders, right? You know, you can't go to an organization and be static, so CISOs are being looked as the leaders, but people that are actually taking people under their wings so they can be the, the leaders of the future. Uh, so a lot of expectations put into the CISO, and then what happened most often than not is that you are not going to be able to actually fulfill the, all the expectations that the company are putting, you know, on you. If you look at and talk to most CISOs, you see that the strategy portion of their responsibilities goes almost unfulfilled most of the time because they are so sucked in into all the operational aspects of the, of the business that they don't really have time to sit down and start looking beyond, right? You know, you are consumed by incidents, by things that, you know, you have to do, the business is coming to you, compliance. Uh, it almost feel like um, that you are losing your footing and it really is causing a lot of heartburn and, and burnout into the CISOs. And, you know, quite frankly, I think that it was a presentation on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, at the CISO summit, that somebody put some figures there that says like, there are about 35% of the CISOs that are unhappy, you know, with their positions today. I'll go in a bold statement here, and I can tell you that that figure is really more than the 75%. If you talk to any CISO today, they'll tell you that if, if, they, if they are given the choice, they'll leave. And I'll, I'll say that there's a high number of them that are very, very unhappy right now that given the opportunity, they'll go and do something else. 
you know, today. So it's a, it's a big problem because they have a lot of responsibility, and yet there's a lot of discontent. And I can tell you there's nothing worse for a human being that you've been doing something and you're unhappy about doing that something. And that's actually not a good thing for, for anybody, not, surely not for the companies and the businesses, but for the individuals themselves. So, so what happened here, you know, we're coming now to what is called the Great Cecil Resignation Era, right? You know, you get a lot of people there. Um, this information actually comes from an article from Forbes, uh, published this past July. Um, um, this, this slide deck, you know, is going to be shared so you can look at the reference and you can look it up yourself. But, you know, the, the main point here is, you know, what I mentioned before. CISOs are feeling burnout. They feel that they are not getting the support they need. Uh, companies are looking at ways to reduce the amount of money they're spending in security. Um, again, on, on Thursday, we had a presentation about this as to why the companies are doing this. And I think, it, you know, uh, partly to blame upon ourselves, right? Companies have continually steadily increasing budgets for the last 20 years is, you know, or so, and the results are getting worse, right? You know, the companies are not getting more secure. Certainly you're not seeing less incidents or breaches, and yet the amount of money that is going into cybersecurity is staggering, even, even you know, even today, right? Um, on top of that, also they're suffering about, you know, the, the attrition rate, right? Um, there was a time where poaching good talent from one company to another was rampant, right? You know, you, you were looking at people who were jumping from one company to another, even today, you can still see at all levels, from an analyst all the way to a security architect, that their tenure at a company is pretty short. You're not seeing people actually staying more than two or three years in a company because you know, greener pastures are elsewhere. Well, that causes a lot of different issues, you know, when, when it comes, you know, for a CISO, because now all that knowledge, right, all the, all the culture, all the, you know, the different aspects that that person had injected into the team is gone, and now you have to bring somebody in, now retrain, get them adapted to the culture that you have and, and your style, and get the benefit for that, you know, on, on average, that's about six to nine months of lost productivity. That, that does a, you know, a, 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 a huge dent into what you're trying to achieve as a CISO. So attrition is another thing that has contributed a lot into why CISOs feel, you know, this way. The next point is around the operational. Like I said before, CISOs are people that are looked to be leaders thought leaders, right? You know, people that are gonna be strategizing for the company and why not? But because all the other elements that I mentioned before, they're being sucked in in the majority of the operational, you know, aspects of the, of, of the business, and now they feel like their value has been diminished. They feel that they're not being able to do what they really wanna do, and obviously that creates a morale issue. So. When you talk to somebody, it's like, hey, I would like to do all these different things, but I really don't have the time. I don't, I don't feel that I have the support to actually do these things. Now, with all these things, obviously comes the opportunity, right? So there's an opportunity to really innovate, you know, the, the way CISOs actually work. And this is where the rise of this, the VCISO uh, come, come so importantly because the VC, so is a, is a different type of uh, animal here when, when he talks about how do we approach the things, you know, with, with businesses, right? Um, first of all, because we are actually going with specific tasks, we are more uh, incentivized to actually get results and outcomes. And I'll explain in a second what I mean by that, right? Um, the role itself whether it is on a short term or in a long term, really is based on outcomes, as opposed to somebody that just came in, is hired, 
you're going to be responsible for this or responsible for that. The, 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 the purview of the, of the VC so really is to focus on the outcomes that the organization needs. So you're going to come in, and if they come in and say, hey, I need just to keep the lights on, that's what you're going to do. You come in, do it, leave. Hey, I need you to come here and review my security program. That's what you go, you do it, get the results that you need, and then you move. That actually turns out to be a, a very good model because it's a win-win situation in a lot of the instances with the companies because, um, like in my case, I try to focus on the small, small medium size that they are looking to have a CISO, ideally somebody with a lot of experience, somebody that comes with a, a good background, having worked with big names, right? Uh, if you're in the financial sector, having to work you know, with one of the top banks, right? You know, being a country you know, CISO for that bank, that carries a lot of weight, you know, and people are looking to have that experience, right? You know, that, uh, that know-how, but they can't afford it. So now in the model, you're able to actually extend that knowledge and give these things for very purpose activities that they need to fulfill. Now, also, because we continue to evolve, right, the role of the VCSO too is not just to replace a CISO on a temporary basis or just to be the face. In some instances, you're going to be augmenting you know, in, in an organization, whoever is already the CISO there, right? On the same basis, right? You may have somebody that has been being promoted, uh, and I'll talk a little bit when, when I get to my personal journey, I'll give you a, a more precise example of that. But you come in, this person is not as experienced, they still need somebody to take them under their wing, help them to mature, somebody that can mentor them, somebody that can coach them, and then you perform that function for the organization, and then when that person is ready to really take the reins and continue the, uh, uh, the journey, then you have fulfilled your mission and you can move in, right? You know, move out, I should say. So having that model actually helps a lot of the organizations because they get somebody with the experience but at the same time, without having the commitment that they have to bring, you know, a high six figures, in some instances, you know, some companies, you know, you're pushing, you know, seven figures, you know, uh, salaries, you know, and compensation and everything else, and they, they get the results that they're looking for. So the advantages, you know, of this, it is that, as I mentioned, it's consumption-based. I mean, it... If you go in, it's like very purpose. This is what I need. I need you for this long, you know, whether it's in, in, in a monthly basis or it's a weekly basis or whatnot. Those are things that they dictate. When you hire somebody, you get that person full time for the number of hours, regardless whether you like it or not, you have it there. So there's a big difference you know, when it comes you know, to the VCC world and whatnot. For small and medium size, as I mentioned before, is a great deal for them. Because in, in a lot of the instances, they're getting a lot of expertise, people that have proven in the market, they come with a, a, a good tracking record, and, and without having to break the bank, right, you know, for them. Then also, as I, I said before, you become a trainer and, and a coach for potentially somebody that down the road can fulfill that function, right? You know, they may have a good, say, security architect, you know, been five, seven years in the company, they're not really ready to be full-blown CISOs, but having somebody maybe for a couple years doing that coaching, leading them, mentoring, and why not, is a progressive succession, and they stay there, right? So it, it, it helps the organization to really look at Hey, I can get a, a you know a, a good technical uh, thought leader into my organization without having to make a long-term commitment to it, right? Uh, and it's actually pretty appealing for a lot of companies just for for that same reasons, right? 
Um, so, you know, you pay for what you really need, right? You, you put there, you know, when you, when you look at the CISO versus CISO, I mean, you go with a CISO, you know, you're, you're fully committed. And, and don't take me wrong, this is not a model that works for everybody, right? Big companies, even medium-sized companies, they're likely better served to have a full-blown CISO, right? Because the amount of work and the different things that, you know, this, this person has to be responsible for, you, you cannot have the luxury to have somebody that, um, you know, hey, I got something else, I got a different gig, and that person is gone, right? So, so you're, you're better served, you know, to have what, but for smaller organizations and some of the medium-sized organizations, this is actually very good because they don't have to make that full commitment, and at the same time, they get to the outcomes. The return on investment, or what I coin here, value over investment. I'm sure you hear a lot of times that people try to portray security, cybersecurity as a return on investment. I'm on the bank of, as I say, don't say that, you know. If you take the function of cybersecurity on its own, it will never, ever make a dime for anybody. You, as, a, as a discrete function, you don't make money. So when I hear these things, I always cringe because it's like, we are not about returning on the investment that we do. We are about to provide value on what people invest on us, right? And that value actually turns into different ways, right? You know, different shapes. For instance, our mission is to really protect the organization. So their goals, right, their growth projections, right, their revenue projections actually materialize, right, that something won't derail that plan. So that's the value that we provide to the organization. We are, if they were to grow 30% over the next, ten, you know, 10 years and in, go with a 50% revenue stream increase, our value is to ensure that that actually happens, right? That because if that actor came up and why not took the, the, the business down. So, so I think it is very important to make the distinction between the return on investment and the value of the investment because that's really what we bring to the table, especially the CISOs, right? We bring value for the organization. The other side is like being the short term versus the full time, right? We, we can be also long term because in some instances they need to have somebody for over, over a, a long period of time. But we are not part of the organizations in the sense that we are salary, we have the benefits, you know, we're looking for all these different things. We're there for what they need. So they get exactly what they need, and they pay for what they need. Lastly, I would like to say that because we come in in that fashion, then we can actually focus more strategically for the, for the companies, right? In my experience, you know, thus far, um, you know, fulfilling, you know, the, the VC so um, roles, is that organizations tend to be more open to listening. And as a result, being able to actually let you drive them, guide them strategically as opposed to be tactically. And that is a big thing that you know, a lot of CISOs complain about, but it is because companies are going very purposely. It's like going and buying a car. You're buying a car for a purpose, you know, and this is what I wanna get from the car and whatnot. And, this is the same thing when they come and look for a VC. So they're looking for very specific things, and typically those things are strategically. We want to move from this manual, uh, very old traditional way of business into this other big thing that now we consider is the way of the future, right? You know, and that comes with the digital transformation and all sorts of different things. And I can tell you in the banking industry, there are a lot of different things happening. The company, you know, small banks are looking in order to compete, right? Everything from digital wallets, 
you know, they want to be, you know, be offering services at the local markets where people can do loans, you know, to buy solar panels and do the whole different things. So there are a lot of opportunities, but those companies are not traditionally positioned to take advantage of that. Now, with this model, it helps them to actually achieve that because there are other things that they can take, right? You know, with the FinTech models and other things, having a VC so help them to take advantage of all those, I will say, digital offerings that are in place right now. And the VC so actually help them ensure that everything's secure, again, bring value to the organization rather than being looked as another cost center or something that uh, really is not bringing what, you know, the, the, the outcomes that they're expecting. The VCs has also, you know, bring something special too, right? Um, you can be a VC, so really coming out of the street, right? It, it's not. I mean, this is something that you have to been one, right? Um, typically several times, you got the experience, so, so you know exactly what entails and what needs to be done, and that's the value proposition, right? We're coming to the table, we're looking to do these things in a very discreet or very uh, purpose manner, but it's because we know exactly what needs to be done, right? So, so definitely the experience that the CISOs bring play a, a very big part of why they are turning into VCSOs because now they're saying, hey, I got all the experience, I've been in the battle, now I can actually be very, very explicit into the things that I want to do and the things that I want to really excel and they can go out and then look for those things out there uh, and do it. Also, I'll say, you know, what I call the basics, right? Because um, you've been there, you've done that. Typically, as somebody that has been several times CISO and, you know, been in the business, they have grown through the ranks for the most part. You know, most of the people that are from my generation, um, they're people that started at, you know, as a network engineer, right? You started knowing really the basics. You understood, you know, what was going through the wire. You knew how to use a sniffer, right? You know, all the different things. You, you could depack, you know, uh, decompose a packet, uh, go to an application, figure out what was wrong. You know, I'm not a coder, but, you know, it's been forced many times. So, so you carry a lot of knowledge with you, not necessarily that is strategic, but it helps you to really understand. So I, I use always the analogy, you cannot build a building starting on the 15th floor. It's physically impossible, right? For being a good CISO, there's no way you can actually start on the 15th floor. It's like, hey, I only done, you know, GRC. I have nothing against that, but, you know, personally, there's a lot missed there. Because if you don't understand the basics, right, you know, a lot of the things, look at the attacks, right? You know, they still doing this, looking to exploit some application or some misconfiguration in a system. You're looking at things that, you know, if you don't understand that realm and you're leaving everything to somebody else, you know, to figure out, you're, you're missing out. So it's important to come with that tool back with you as part of the VC. So because you're there, you know, likely in, in places where they don't have a lot of expertise. They don't have a lot of uh, uh, specialis specialization, you know, in-house, in right? They don't have an army of people, right? You know, many times they don't even have a sock, right? So, so it's important that you actually bring those parts and you understand what is happening because you're going to steer them, right? I mean, whether they want to build their, their, their teams in-house in or they want to go into a... Uh, outsource model where they go going to create partnerships and bring other people into the mix. But you need to have that, that knowledge so you can actually select the right people, whether in-house or, or externally. Also because of the experience of being up and down, right? I'll be the first one. I fail many times because so I go thinking about something. Oh, it, the important thing about this is that it's not that you've been up and down but it's how you recover from those things, right? How quickly and how do you actually move, you know, into the other direction as that these things are happening. So if you've been around, likely, and if you've been successful and you get, you know, good reputation, 
It's likely because you fail many times, but you knew how to actually recover from those failures. And, you know, let's be fair. This is not a thing about if we get breached, right? But it's when we get breached. So you need to have somebody that knows that if there's a failure, we got breached or why not, not only, you know, has done all the due diligence and done everything possibly to, ooh, ooh, what happened here? Oh, this was, there's no power here. Oh, sorry. Uh, thought that that has power there. Uh, all right. Let's see. Hopefully, come back quickly. Apologies for that. I, I didn't realize that this thing was dead. I just plug it in and <laughs> realize it is there and why not. Um, see, see that this is on, but uh, trying to see here. And we don't have anybody here that Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. Are you seeing danger when it comes to demands of this ratio for sutras that are leaking, sutras that didn't work out, or we never had a sutra before, we want to try out the sutra and see if it's changed? Like, what are the use cases for change? So, I'm going to tell you that. The ones that I've seen the most is that they are letting CISOs go. And I have at least three companies that has reached me in the last, um, uh, I will say, um, there you go. In the last uh, four months that they come, uh, you know, come to me and say, we're not happy, you know, we just sh shook hands, you know, with the CISO. And in fact, one of my, my current customer right now in upstate New York, that's exactly what they did. Now, the other side too is that um, there's some companies that they never had a, a CISO. And uh, I, I'm actually working with one now that, you know, try to get in, in, in there. And it's because they, they never thought that they really needed to have, you know, somebody uh, formally. They had somebody performing the manager uh, function with them. But now, because of regulations, they realize we need to have a named person. So now it's a, it's a different ball game for them. So I, I, what I'm seeing more and more is that companies, and, and I'll, you know, that, that's a good segue, is that they are looking at eliminating the full-time uh, CISO position and going into a more VCISO scheme for them. And uh, I mean, and this is not just in a particular market, right? The people that I talk to, they're completely verticals. There was one, in, you know, <laughs> it, it sounds funny, but one of them was one of the top three executive search firms in the states. You guys can Google and, and look at the top three and then you figure out. So one of them decided not to have a CISO anymore. They just let the CISO go and they are, you know, looking for a VCISO. Which is, you know, it's kind of concerning because I, I think that somebody touched on this uh, the other day at the, um, at the CISO summit that there's a fatigue, and I've been saying this for several years, there's a fatigue from the companies that they feel that they have spent money and they are not seeing results. And unfortunately, if they feel that they're not gonna get their, their money's worth, you know, they feel it's like, it's no, you know, no better, you know, having a CISO than not having a CISO, so what's the point, right? And, and I always, you know, tell a lot, you know, over RSA, we, 
we have fun, you know, a, a few of my friends and, and I arguing about that point, and I was just telling them, you know, listen, even in the highly regulated environment, if you, you know, if you get a $100 million fine, what is your first reaction? It's like people, oh, man, you know, that, that's going to take the company down. Oh, wait a second. I haven't finished yet. If I tell you that on top of the $100 million fine, I made a $2 billion profit while I got that fine, what is my incentive to do anything? I still make $1.9 billion worth of profit. They say, this is the problem that most of us CISOs have not realized yet. That is, you know, we keep on hearing about business and business and business, but that's what the part that we need to get to is the bottom line. Most of the businesses are not because of cybersecurity or IT or whatnot. They have some offering or some product or whatnot. That's what makes money. We need to adapt into that, that, to that world to ensure that actually we provide value, right? Yes. The ones that I have are outcome based. We have very specific things and we have timelines to actually measure those. So they are more project like based. And that's where I said, hey, we need a project or a program in place. We need a roadmap in place. We need a budget right, roughly of what this is going to be required for us. So those are the ones. I will say for the most part are not hourly based because that's not, that's more of a staff augmentation. The companies are bringing you in. Keep in mind, you're not doing this for $25 an hour. So they're, they're spending a pretty penny for this. Still less money, but let's be serious, right? You know, you're not doing this for charity. So companies are incentivized to make sure that it's very clear what the outcomes are. Because otherwise, you know, they're not going to do anything. And I think it is in your own best interest to make sure that if the companies are not pushing hard enough to establish clearly what those outcomes are, that you do it. Because, you know, you want them to be, re you know, your referenceable account, right? If, you, if you're a VC, so likely you are doing it on your own or you're with some small companies. This is not something that you're going to be doing with IBM or whatnot. They may have those offerings, but that's not their, their bread and butter. That's not what they're going to be looking. So you want them to actually speak volumes of you, right, you know, in, in a good way. So if, if, they, if they're not clear on what they want to get, that's your opportunity to shine because they're going to come back. You know, I can tell you. Right now, even though I'm still in flight with this bank, they have given me a lot of references, you know, good references, and, and it's two-way because they trust you now, right? You know, and, and, and this is something that is important too, right? Um, as you adapt, you know, with, with the role and everything else, it, it brings other benefits too, right? Because we, we are biased. Well, let's put it this way, right? You know, there's no way that we can say that we are not biased. And people say we're vendor agnostic and whatnot. It's like, no, no, that's, that's not true. We actually look for the things, and we know what works, what doesn't work, and what things may work. So guess what? That's exactly what we're going to do with these customers, right? You're going to say, hey, here's the vision. Here's how you actually implement and you realize that vision. So you're going to bring others into the mix, right? Personally, I'm not looking to actually be the architect, to be the engineer and why not. And then through others, bring other people. It's like, hey, I know this person. I know this vendor and why not. Because my focus is really the strategic area, right? So it's important that we, you know, we kind of like realize that, that as we adapt and you know, get agile and why not, we focus on the value, and the value a lot of times is not just what we do, but what we recommend as well, right? Because 
what you're trying to do is to create really a solid ecosystem. We know that there's a shortage of talent out there and you want to really put yourself in, in, in a camp that you get very trusted people next to you. So I get somebody else in to say, hey, come here, let's do this. I got a customer and why not? And, and that's what I've been you know, building you know, up to this point, you know, kind of like talking to people, bringing and say, hey, here's a good thing, you know, for us to actually capitalize. And it, it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. But the sheer opportunity out there, because, you know, the number of organizations lacking a CISO and they need a CISO is actually quite high. And, you know, there's, as long as you, you're really willing to adapt, right? to the conditions. Because, you know, a lot of people that I talk to, too, you know, friends, they just tell you, I, I can't afford it. You know, I can't, you know, that's too risky. Why not? It's like, that's unfortunate, right? You know, you should be in a position that now in this stage in life, you should be able to do it, right? You know, that you don't, you're not forced that, no, 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 I got to have, you know, this job because otherwise, because what you're doing is perpetuating your complaint. You're not happy where you are, but then you stay there. So, so this, this is one of the areas that really brings um, you know, some interesting things into the VC. So, because it's not for everybody also. Some people want to have the prestige, the name, everything else that uh, you know, comes with it. But you know, it, there, there's risk involved, right? You know, I'm not going to be you know, telling you that, uh, that there's no risk. In, in, into you know becoming a BC so. So shifting gears here, right? You know, um, I, th this is this is interesting because I I, I actually ask uh, you know Dali to create this this image for me, and I'm I'm, I'm I was trying to get something different, but I th I thought that this was funny because I think that what I'm trying to really use with this is the ambulance ambulance chasing. So for for those of us, you know, only know from remembering the attorney, you know, commercials of the eighties and the nineties, you know, you know, looking for somebody that had an accident and, you know, come here and let's sue the the, the hell out of it. Um, in in the CISO world, we got something similar, right? You know, because we get blame and we are always looking, you know, who, who's going to be the scapegoat, you know, when something happens. And uh, I, I hear, you know, different positions, you know, obviously uh, comes to mind the case of Joe Sullivan, you know, wherever you want to go in, into these things. I think what is important to, to realize that here is that um, we, we need to be very, very cognizant that this is a field that is very stressful. So we need to be super comfortable with the fact that transformation is in the making and we have to do a lot of different things in, you know, in the role because adaptability is not an option while you are a CISO, let alone when you're a VCISO. And really the outcomes is what is gonna make not just the organization successful, but will make you successful as a result, right? You need to be looking for those things, so focus and not being just looking for shiny things or, or, or being consumed by fires, you really need to find and strike that balance, right? Equilibrium is extremely important in, 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 in this business because otherwise um, you're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be burned out. As a result, you're gonna quit, right? You know, you're gonna disappear and that's, that's exactly what we're talking about you know, today is that um, you know, so many CISOs feel so burnt out and, and they're really looking a way out, you know, from it. So really quick, you know, we've got, uh, well, five minutes here, but uh, I want to talk a little bit of m my journey because uh, I get this question asked a lot by my mentees, right? I uh, belong to two organizations, Cyversity and Raices. Um, they're focused on minority women and veterans, uh, people that wants to come into the cybersecurity and if you, you know, want to talk to me after that, you know, I'm happy to, to do so. But there are organizations that are looking like here, right? You know, come all the way here to Iowa because what John is doing, right? You know, try to help people 
especially youth at getting to what is the future, right? You know, and it's not even the future, it's the present, because it's, it's now, it's happening, right? But I, I get this picture because this is pretty much, if you're gonna look at what my journey has been, it's been ups and downs, spaghetti type of situation. I've done a lot of different things. And that is because I never had a, a, a proper mentor. I, I didn't have mentors until late in my career. And I have some really, really nice mentors, and that's why my career has accelerated uh, tremendously. But I wanted to highlight that because, you know, I wasn't sure how many, you know, really uh, kids, you know, we were going to have in, 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 in the talk. But this is very, very important and, and something that I want to impress upon you is the importance of giving back, right? It's important because as we look into these things and we look at ourselves in the mirror, you know, there are a lot of other people that needs to start filling up our positions, right? You know, I'm going to be in the business probably for a little while more, but we need to start thinking about the ones before, right? We can't be the hogs that take everything and don't leave anything for anybody else, right? We need to help the younger generations to start filling up those and extend that hand, right? Whether it's, you know, pulling them up, right? Or pushing them up. Either way, we need to look at that. And I think that it's important in everybody's journey to keep that in mind. And I like to do this in all my talks because it's important, right? Giving back, we're looking at perspective. Your CISO, you made it, great career and everything else. Now it's time you need to start looking back and say, hey, I need to help other people. And um, I, I like to talk to anybody. It doesn't matter age, right? Creed, race, religion, it, it doesn't matter. You, you want to talk to me? You want to talk about how do I get here? You know, what are the things that you should be doing actually to, you know, get to a higher state? Happy to do so. All right. So last part here, uh, getting to the end of the presentation. The crystal ball. I don't have one. I can tell you, you heard a lot about AI today, right? Um, and I think appropriately with the title of the presentation, the train has left the station. AI left the station a long time ago. It's been here for a long time. It's just like focusing right now because unfortunately we got so much hype, right? Uh, so much fat, you know, and a lot of different things, but it's accelerating, and it's accelerating at exponential rate. And, and these are the, one of the things that we need to look, right? Not just get wrapped up in the challenges that, you know, we have with this and the ones that we cannot even foresee right now, but the opportunities that the, this will bring, right? And I think that, as I mentioned, those of you that were here earlier, at uh, uh, Rich's uh, you know, presentation that I was telling him about my, my fear. I think that we have a responsibility as citizens that for those that are fearful of the change that this technology is bringing, to help them ease their fears, right? Because that's the future. There'll be a lot of people that will feel threatened by AI we have to help you know, each other you know, in this journey because, I mean, we're, we're in one nation, right? You know, we, we have to make sure that everybody is in that bandwagon, not just a few, but everybody. So we need to actually make sure that when we talk about the challenges that we have and we talk about the opportunities as a result, that we also extend the hand and say, it's okay, we're here, we're gonna help each other, we're gonna make it. So with that, I'm gonna go into any further questions or any comments, anything at all that you guys wanna bring up? Well, no more questions. Thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>